I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, so my name is Alex Chazanoff, and I'm a research program officer at Educopia. Um, and today, uh, I wanted to thank everyone for coming to our inaugural uh, Bit Curator Consortium Roundtable, um, which we started uh, envisioning a couple of months ago as a way to kind of focus on different topics of interest to the Born Digital uh, community uh, of practice to talk about, you know, some exciting projects that are happening and kind of contemporary work that's going on in the field. Um, and so I am really excited to have our guests with us today. Um, today we're going to be talking about the ethics of Born Digital Collecting. Um, we're very honored to welcome four colleagues who are doing extraordinary work. Um, in this area who will uh, speak to their experiences uh, and then we'll have a moderated discussion um, after they present um, some of their work. So we'll ask that you please hold your questions until we do the sort of initial round of uh, each speaker giving a presentation um, to, the discussion, uh, to the discussion time um, where we will have kind of moderated chat going on and. Um, also, our participants have, you know, if we run out of time, even though we have a lot of time scheduled, our participants have said they would be willing to answer some questions um, uh, that we don't get to uh, after the webinar ends. Um, and so uh, Jessica Venle uh, from UNC Chapel Hill and Lauren Work from the University of Virginia um, are first gonna present on this topic of Born Digital uh, collecting and the ethics of born digital collecting from an institutional perspective uh, first and then Alexander Dolan Meskel and Yvonne Ng will talk about this topic from uh, the perspective of kind of community driven resources um, for this work and so uh, what we've been doing in preparation for this call is compiling um, a sort of living resources document um, that I will go ahead and share in the chat window. Um, but this is a, a document, uh, it's right now a Google document that uh, has a lot of links and resources for um, topics and res resources in this area to support people doing this kind of work. Um, and so, yeah, some logistics to set up as sort of Housekeeping. Um, we're meeting. We're meeting everyone upon entry, um, since there's there's a lot of you, and uh, we also want to make sure and request that everybody's video is turned off. So just if everyone can take a double check and make sure you're muted and your video is turned off, uh, there will be it will be a more pleasant experience uh, for the 150 of you, <laughs> I think, um, and. So the logistics we have set up are uh, each presenter is going to introduce and discuss their work and then we're going to have a facilitated discussion. So again, um, if you can hold your questions uh, till afterwards uh, for the discussion portion, that would be appreciated. Um, this event will be recorded and we are planning to make it available to the public on uh, March 27th. Um, we'll be posting information about that, but you can look to the Bit Curator Consortium videos page for that. Um, yeah, and I think uh, to, I'm going to provide a PDF version um, of our presentation in the chat window so it can be downloaded. Um, and we'll also be providing a version with speaker notes incorporated when we release the recording next week. So, I sort of did some of that in this slide, um, but uh, yeah, so let's get started. So thank you all for being here. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone, especially for coming to support the work of archivists and documentarians and community members and activists who are working to challenge or create new practices and born digital work. Um, I see a lot of you in the in the chat and the participants list as well as our four uh, wonderful colleagues who are joining us. Um, 
uh, incorporating what Michelle Caswell refers to as a feminist ethics of care in documentation work, which is to say, um, guided by social justice concerns to use archival thinking and practice to enact a more just vision of society. So let's get started. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, advance slides for people, um, for each of our pre presenters. So Lauren, if you wanted to start and then just go ahead and indicate, you know, slide, advance, that would be great. Okay, up. great, thank you. Um, so thanks very much, uh, Alex, and for the folks that uh, Big Curator put for putting this together. I'm really excited to be part of a great group of colleagues um, on this call. So just to start by way of introduction, um, Lauren Work, I'm the Digital Preservation Librarian at the University of Virginia Library. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about an academic institutional use case for issues around ethics and born digital collecting. So I wanted to start by framing uh, a little bit of the context of my own work to start. So I'm a librarian. I'm a digital preservationist, but I work very closely with archivists and I'm institutionally situated within the Special Collections and Archives and Preservation Department of the Library. So I just wanted to frame this by saying that, you know, my archivist colleagues, you know, we really aim to center our work around some of these existing values frameworks that we all have for our professions. But you know, we all know, I think, that these statements, you know, can only go so far as to actually guiding practice. So I'm really excited to kind of highlight the collaborative work we've done about how we're trying to build some of this structural ethical thinking into ways that we can build on and iterate uh, and practice. So Alex, if you want to go ahead and do next slide, please. Um, so the specific use case I'm going to touch on briefly uh, around ethics and born digital collecting relates to the act of domestic terrorism that happened here in Charlottesville on August 11th and 12th of 2017. Um, I know many of us are very familiar with this at this point, um, but this is just simply an act where white supremacists organized and came to both the University of Virginia, where they were met by student activists and counter protesters, and then March the next day on the city of Charlottesville where they killed Heather Heyer, who was a counter protester. Um, so during and after these events, which were extremely impactful both on the local community here and nationwide, a decision was made by the dean of the library that we should be collecting materials, including digital materials, to try to center uh, the Charlottesville community and UVA around the local experience of these events. So I, I mentioned that at the top, you know, because in the year or so since uh, this has happened, year plus, um, I realized that this action is not something that was necessarily be taken um, at all institutions and in all places. So I kind of want to center that by first saying that this was, this was requested by the Dean of the Library. Um, so if we go on to the next tool slide, Alex. Um, so this is just kind of a way to highlight um, some of the things that were necessary uh, to enact some of this request. So on the left, you'll see that there are some of the tools and systems that a lot of folks are probably familiar with. Uh, we set up to collect uh, with. So some of these we had in place prior to the event. So that's things like Archivit and Web Recorder. Uh, we had a Google form set up for web submissions, but there are other tools, you know, in this list for collection like Twark. Uh, the Omeka Public Collection website that were completely new for UVA. Um, and as many of you know, again, a lot of these tools make it very easy to rapidly collect large amounts of data, um, which we'll come back to in another slide. But I also wanted to highlight to the right, um, it's a representation of this kind of necessary accompanying work that we try to undertake around personal and kind of community action for collection around the event. So we had things like outreach events uh, in the community to kind of talk to and help you know, people submit if they wanted to to this Omeka site that we created. Uh, we also reached out and talked with you know, folks like student activist groups who were there at UVA on that Friday night. We worked to provide documentation and follow through with those who were interested in partnerships or just honestly wanted to know a little bit more about what we were doing and talk to us about, you know, maybe what they were doing in the community. So 
Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, I kind of wanted to pause here to talk about um, how we try to kind of structure privacy and ethics concerns within some of our work around collecting, uh, including some kind of granular things about how we try to integrate some of this thinking into actual, you know, the tools and the collecting itself, but also more importantly, also kind of highlighting the ways that we are still structuring, configuring, you know, kind of this lower in-depth work around things like our institutional role, uh, or sometimes a, a non-role in communities as needed. Um, things like collection policies, how we work with students and organizations. So um, some of the things to start we did around collection specifically was we asked a lot of questions. Um, so we talked with everyone and anyone, you know, including a lot of folks who have been here long before we have. So those were the folks from Documenting the Now, um, of People's uh, Archive of Police Violence in Cleveland, the folks behind Baltimore Uprising website, uh, Documenting Ferguson. So really just talking with folks um, and kind of learning from and knowing questions to ask and building on work was a big part of our initial kind of walkthrough of thinking about these issues. And then we just started to think very carefully about, you know, the aspect of what submitting to a digital collection site would mean for a community, mean for the library and the collection. So all this meant that there was a little bit of a slower launch uh, to the website, which was a bit of a struggle, uh, I think, for some in the library who wanted it released a little more quickly. But my personal opinion uh, is that it was worth its time to get it right. And so I'm glad that we took the time to walk through and do that and talk with folks. Um, so the collection site itself is, um, I'll drop it into the chat really quickly so folks can take a look. So what we did structurally on the site uh, were things like make sure that we talked to um, our director of information policy to make sure that the terms for submission were clearly stated. So what, is it, what does it mean if you submit digital materials for collection? You know, whether it can be kept private, can be made public, um, allowed us to really effectively center and tell people what it means and what we could or could not do with materials, uh, ways that allowed us to do things like effectively have a, a deed of gift kind of structure that protected the rights of the submitter, uh, while also allowing the library to take things like preservation action on, you know, collection submissions as necessary. Something else we wanted to do with this site was also make materials available as quickly as possible with permission. Um, to the community, and this kind of spoke to the recognized feeling that sometimes giving things to an institution, it kind of disappears behind a wall and you never see it again. Um, but so we wanted to have a way that with permission, if people had said, yes, this is okay for this image that I took to be publicly accessible, we did that as quickly as possible through Omeka to say, you know, here you've submitted this thing, we've given the permission, here it is in the context with this collection um, with other folks who have submitted things from the community and from UVA. Um, so things that we're still working on, um, I mentioned, you know, the fact that Twitter data collection was very new for UVA. And so for many administrative and community reasons, we actually haven't made this data available yet. And the reasons for that include, you know, on the administrative side, we had no real existing policy or procedure or infrastructure by which we could make this data available, but were asked, you know, to collect, which I, I think folks are probably familiar with. Um, on the kind of ethical side, we really need to work through actually working with student groups, working with people to get their consent and potential, you know, donation of their own social media presence. And I know Jessica can talk to this next. Um, with her experience. So we're working on that, um, continuing to build those relationships and center that. We've also, you know, had to make decisions. And I think this has really been talked about a lot. Folks who are deeply involved, documents in the now, who have worked in communities where these kind of large data sets, um, this is a reality in Charlottesville. This is something that happens here. There's people who could be harmed by the release of data that may have been compiled. Um, as part of the Twitter data collection that we did around specific hashtags, but by allowing time to pass, you know, and this, this is a great thing that's in the resource document, there's a lot of frameworks around thinking through why, how, what's the cut, like what is the benefit of releasing a lot of this information. So for us, 
you know, there's ongoing litigation, there's continuing threats of physical violence. Um, so this is something where, again, I think a delay and clearly thinking through these issues is okay. And so it's something that we've been asking ourselves. And we've gotten more toward answers to those questions for ourselves. Um, and so I think in future, we hopefully will be um, able to walk through what that looks like to make things available. Another institutional reality I wanted to highlight um, is that in 2017, we didn't yet have a active university archivist. Um, and so her arrival in 2018 has actually really helped us begin to build you know, these structural things. So these ethical connections at UVA, particularly with student groups, and also around community-centered archival work. So these are really important components um, that we continue to work on as part of this ongoing collection. And this isn't just for this event-based collection, but also you know, kind of a groundwork for how we think about born digital collections you know, as a whole. Um, so I wanted to take a minute, and Alex, if you can go through to the next slide. Um, yeah, so this is just an example I wanted to give folks to this snapshot of kind of this terms of service. You know, this is a way that we structurally built some things into the website. And if you go on to the slide after that, I wanted to highlight, you know, some questions. So Justin Littman, who was at GW for a long time, I'd worked with Social Feed Manager, um, I think is now at Stanford. Just again, this question around talking with the community, really thinking through these issues, this kind of caught my eye too. Um, you know, thinking about embargoes and how we think through actually releasing tweets. And he had asked this question on Twitter, of course. And uh, if you go to the next slide, there are just some really good responses from folks like Ed Summers, um, thinking through what a community means, how you censor some of these things. Um, so this was something for me that really helped um, kind of think through these issues a little bit as well. And so lastly, I just want to finish by, Alex, if you go to the next slide, um, I wanted to highlight where some of these materials are, you know, located currently. So Justin had collected around the hashtag of Charlottesville, which we also collected locally. Um, but because GW, you know, has gone through and has policy, has procedure, has really thought through these issues, uh, I felt okay, you know, sharing this with you all. I think they felt great, you know, sharing it where I wanted to highlight the work that, you know, folks have already done and kind of center, you know, what we're maybe working towards ourselves. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to Jessica. Alex, I think you might need to unmute. Oh, no, Jess, you're good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, all right, so um, I think there are you know, a variety of areas of born digital collecting and university archives that can kind of raise some potentially new ethical considerations. Um, but kind of similar to Lauren, I'm gonna open with um, kind of focusing on a case study of collecting hashtags and other kind of web-based digital material um, related to recent student activism at UNC Chapel Hill um, that's kind of been ongoing for about a year and a half at this point. Um, oh, next slide. So can I get the next slide? Oh, thank you. Um, okay, so before I jump into the details of our approach and kind of what we've been thinking about and doing, um, I thought I should just provide kind of a super brief summary of the recent events um, that have happened just to give some context for the rest of the presentation. Um, so the UNC Confederate Monument, known as Silent Sam, has been the subject of and the site of protests um, for decades. And the latest wave of protests began in August of 2017 with a rally on the first day of classes. And then in August um, 2018, again on the first day of classes, a rally was held at Silent Sam, and that night, um, protesters toppled the statue from its pedestal. And then skipping ahead, um, in January, oh, not the slide, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, in January of 2019, um, Chancellor Folt had the pedestal removed and then resigned from her position. 
Um, and throughout that time, kind of in the past year and a half, there have been many additional um, demonstrations and advocacy from anti-racist activists on campus, um, students and community members. Um, and there have also been on campus demonstrations from neo-Confederate white supremacist groups um, as well. And the plan for the final disposition of the monument, whether it will be back on campus somewhere or permanently removed from campus, um, is kind of unknown at this point. So um, there's been no kind of resolution in that area. So, um, you know, this is by no means a complete telling of everything that has happened in the past year and a half. Um, so if you're kind of unfamiliar with the events, I would encourage you to kind of Google for more information and look at some of the local news sources in this, you know, part of North Carolina. Um, so next slide. So um, our initial kind of question in the University Archives in 2017, um, like many archivists who might find themselves kind of in this kind of situation where you want to collect something that's happening in the moment, um, you start thinking about whether you can or sh and should um, collect tweets related to the events that are happening. Um, I was personally pretty concerned about, I mean, really concerned about privacy and consent. I also had questions about some of the technical sort of limitations that can make hashtag collections kind of hard to collect or hard to use. Um, but kind of long story short, um, we ultimately decided that Twitter has facilitated new approaches for sparking action on campus and that it was really unique to this moment and we felt it would be an important addition to other records in the archives that kind of document um, student activism. So the Hashtags on this slide are just some of the ones that um, were used. The hashtag silent Sam and hashtag silence Sam are two of the kind of main ones that we've seen um, used a lot. Um, so next slide. Um, once we kind of made this decision, the next thing was to develop some kind of plan that we could feel good about. Um, so our approach is, you know, based on our local context and the things that are happening here, but we, you know, it's also kind of based on existing resources on the ethics of social media archiving. Um, like Lauren was saying, when you start getting into a project like this, I think a good starting point is to look at examples, look at what other people have done, and kind of take the time to do the research um, and talk to people. I actually talked to Lauren, who's one of the people I talked to. Um, so, you know, based on kind of this research that we were doing, yeah, um, our team had discussions and um, this kind of on this slide is sort of a summary of kind of the approach that we came up with. So I'll just go through some of these points. Um, we never set out to be comprehensive for Twitter. Um, we were going for kind of a snapshot of this communication tool um, and we knew we probably wouldn't get all the tweets and that is okay with us. Um, we also wanted to just set some parameters on collecting um, to kind of shape our thinking about what we were doing. So we didn't just want to collect indefinitely. Um, you know, so in 2017, we sort of decided to collect for a semester, kind of that fall semester when um, the first uh, protest had happened. And then, um, you know, I kind of thought that might be all the hashtag collecting that we would do. But um, it became you know, clear uh, in 2018 that the movement and the protests were, would be continuing. Um, and we kind of updated our approach to collecting hashtags, um, kind of looking at two to three week periods around any significant like demonstrations on campus, um, kind of as you know, a time that would sort of trigger us to do a little bit more hashtag collecting kind of in a time bound way. Um, Another kind of parameter that we were looking at was how we would do the collecting. Um, we were using Twerk and we decided on kind of weekly searches rather than doing a lot of filtering live um, during demonstrations. Um, and we only searched for the hashtags. Um, we did not do any like keyword searching. Um, I kind of view hashtags as a type of like purposeful kind of public participation that is sort of different from public tweets that don't include hashtags. Um, though I do want to acknowledge that, you know, this approach might not fully account for tweets that may not have used hashtags, but were retweeted with a hashtag by someone else. So it's not like a perfect um, way to handle it, but I 
do like kind of having that parameter of, you know, we want to have the hashtag actually used in the things that we're collecting. Um, we do ask for permission in some cases, like with the kind of general hashtag collecting, um, you know, it's not really possible to ask permission of everyone participating, but for other things, um, we have been asking for permission, like for a Twitter account, for example, we would ask for permission. And it's been really interesting, kind of challenging to consider when like web content, not just the hashtags or Twitter content, but other things being shared online, um, you know, are kind of meant for like public notice where you maybe wouldn't feel like you need to ask permission, like maybe a Facebook event, um, you know, for a protest that would be happening on campus. And then other times when web content is like less clearly for public notice, um, you just kind of feel this stronger need, like you should ask for permission. Um, so examples of that might be like an activist website um, or threads on Twitter that didn't use hashtags, but were like a really interesting thread um, of tweets and things like that. Um, and then the last bit is the access piece. Um, access to the hashtag collections is by tweet ID only. Um, we are providing access to um, a portion of the tweets that have been collected up to this point. Um, we created a finding aid. We did a blog post about um, the collecting that we did and kind of what we had. I think we sort of saw this providing access to the tweet IDs and doing a blog post as a way to be transparent with kind of what we were doing and what we had collected. Um, and additions to the collection, you know, as there have been other demonstrations where we've collected are kind of processed and added to the finding aid like several weeks after, been, after being collected. So there is some lag time um, before things are made accessible. Um, but access like Lauren was talking about um, is one of the really challenging areas. So I'm sure we'll talk about it more in the like discussion um, section of today's meeting. Um, okay, uh, and next slide, please. Um, okay, so one thing that has also served us well um, is a document that we made early on in 2017 after we had collected hashtags for a couple of weeks. And we did all this research, we were kind of reacting to what was going on, trying to start collecting hashtags. Um, but we knew that hashtags alone were not enough. Like, um, you know, Twitter can't tell the complete story of what's happening or what the movement is about. So we drafted a document um, for University Archives staff that kind of outlined our approach, including the hashtags, but beyond the hashtags. Um, and I think this document has been a really good touchstone for us. Um, and kind of, we have regularly, you know, sat down together and, and just checked in about our approach and things that have happened and if we're still on the right track. Um, the tone and kind of context surrounding the protest here changed a lot between 2017 and then in 2018, 2019, um, there's a toppling statue, there have been increased concerns about safety, and just this drawn out process to kind of decide what the disposition of the statue is going to be. Um, you know, a lot of these kinds of things have just, they prompt you to do some reflection, to do assessment of your approach, for collecting and access to materials. Um, and this is actually kind of an, an assessment um, time is going on for us right now um, in University Archives. Like we've had conversations this week and last week. Um, so I think it's you know, important to be thinking actively about what you've done in the past, what you're doing now, um, related to foreign digital things that are online um, that you might want to collect. Um, and then I just, I will just end by saying, I think I have a lot more questions than answers when it comes to the ethics of born digital collecting. Um, but I did want to share just four just kind of takeaways from my experience um, doing this so far. Um, and then I'll turn it over to the next person. So the, the first kind of takeaway um, for me is that there's really no room for autopilot um, on doing this. Like you can't just set twerk crawls or set web archive crawls and kind of let that be that. And I think this is, you know, not like a new Thing to say. I think a lot of people who've been doing work in this space for a while are, have said this, and so I'm just kind of reiterating that that has been true to my experience as well. Um, the second thing is that you might not know kind of the most perfect way to collect things. You might make, you know, technical or collection development sort of mistakes as you go, but I think if you're articulating and reflecting on what your approach is, what your goals are, you'll be more consistent, you'll be better off um, in the long run. The third thing is to really take time to slow down. Um, sometimes there can be a lot of pressure. You have colleagues asking you, like, what are you doing? Are you collecting this? What's going on? 
Um, and so it can feel a little overwhelming, um, but definitely take that time to slow down and reflect and think about um, kind of what you're doing and what your goals are. And then just the last um, thing is that, you know, while there are no easy answers, especially for kind of social media collecting, um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of fantastic resources and people who have been doing this um, that you can look to and that you can, you know, use to help understand what the issues are and then kind of apply that to your context. Um, so that's what I have and I'll pass it on to the next person. Thank you. Um, oh, I am unmuted now. Um, Alex, could you go back one slide? I think we've advanced one slide too far. Great, thank you. Oh, now we've gone back one too far. There we are. <laughs> um, uh, thanks, Alex, for organizing this and everybody else who was involved in, in setting this up. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, so my name is Yvonne Ng. I'm a senior archivist at Witness, which is a nonprofit organization that supports people to use video and technology to defend human rights. Um, we work internationally with local human rights partners um, to support their campaigns where there is an identified gap in the use of video and where we think that use of video can have a real human rights impact. Um, I think it might be easier to explain our work and the underlying ethical approach um, that we take, which informs that work with some concrete examples. So I'm going to talk a little bit about just one of our programs, namely our U.S. program, because I think that's where most of the people participating on, on this call today are coming from. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, Alex, please. So one of the focus areas in our US work is immigration enforcement abuse and um, supporting partners um, who work to expose abuses by Border Patrol and who, advo who advocate for immigrants' rights. Um, so, and, and training is a big part of what we do. So in the past year, for example, we partnered with the Rio Grande Valley Equal Voice Network to facilitate community trainings on topics like the video advocacy strategy and digital security. Um, next slide, please. Um, besides training, our work also includes creating resources like tip sheets, case studies, and videos like this checklist here on how to film immigration enforcement um, strategically, ethically, and safely. Um, and this resource and many other resources can be found um, on our website at library.witness.org. And everything um, on the library can be downloaded, can be reused, and it can be customized by, by anyone. Um, next slide, please. Um, I also wanted to highlight here another resource um, from our U.S. immigration work that I think is relevant to our ethics discussion today. Um, it's an article written by Michelle Serrano uh, from the Rio Grande Valley Equal Voice, uh, e Equal Voice Network uh, entitled, What Journalists Should Know Before Reporting on Border Communities. Um, and I think it's relevant to um, people besides just journalists, like anyone who's, who's using um, uh, visual representations or data to, to represent, um, to tell stories or represent border communities. And she gives some really useful guidance on the responsible and ethical uh, use of visual rep representations, the use of language and historical context of the area. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of archiving, video archiving is just one of the areas where, that we offer training and support on to the partners that we work with. So that's sort of to say that uh, archiving kind of feeds into all of the other work and is meant to help a partner achieve their advocacy goals um, rather than being done sort of for its own sake. Um, so in the past year, we've worked on two projects in the US that have an archival component, um, both of them centered on police accountability, which I'll talk a little bit um, about next. So this first project, Profiling the Police, was a partnership with El Grito de Sunset Park, which is a community group um, in Brooklyn that addresses civil rights and public policy concerns, including policing in the community. Um, together, we created a use case study that explored how cop watching videos and open source or public information 
could be collected, analyzed, and used to tell stories about police abuse um, and to address the, the lack of publicly accessible data about officer misconduct. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, archival, the archival parts of this project included um, digitizing some of El Clito's older mini DV tapes, as you can see in this photo here, um, arranging those digitized as well as their born digital video files, and creating a metadata scheme um, for cataloging those videos, which we did just in a spreadsheet. Um, next slide, please. Um, those archival steps provided the groundwork for the team to then analyze the data that they had and to create timelines of documented um, officer misconduct. So that's just a snippet of, of one of the timelines that we created. Sorry, you can go ahead, next slide. Um, and all of the methodologies um, we used, including the sort of archival preservation methodologies, um, were published in the toolkit section of that Profiling the Police website. And you can see the link um, on the bottom of the slide. Um, next slide, please. So right now, uh, we're working on a project with Berkeley Cop Watch, um, which is a community-based organization in Berkeley, obviously, that has been operating um, since 1990. Um, we're helping them to streamline their workflows for ingesting the videos that they record during their cop watching shifts and helping them build um, their internal database um, of incidents and incident documentation so that they can better track their data in support of their advocacy work. Um, and so that they can make, make that data available to other police accountability efforts um, nationwide. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, these examples I've given are all coming from our US program, but we actually do trainings and collaborations like this in um, also in Latin America, Middle East and North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and in Southeast Asia. And the, one of the benefits of our global structure is that it allows us to connect across these regions to build solidarity um, between our partners and to share learning with each other. Um, so for example, We've strengthened the work that we've done on police violence in both the US and in Brazil by bringing together our team members and partners from these regions together um, to share um, strategies and methodologies. And we've done this on, on numerous, numerous occasions. Um, next slide, please. Um, we also create training resources um, within our regions that we translate, customize, and repurpose in other regions. Um, so for example, in 2017, we worked with some amazing archivists and volunteers from the ABPA, and I won't attempt to say it in Portuguese, but in English, uh, the collective is called Brazilian Association of Audiovisual Preservation, um, to create a Portuguese version of our activist guide to archiving video, um, which was originally published in English, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, next slide, please. Um, and around that same time, we also created a training video that explains the value of archiving for human rights advocacy, which we produced originally for use in Brazil, but we also created an English um, version for. Um, next slide. So there are a lot of ethical considerations baked into um, how Witness strives to do the work that we do. And um, I hope that we can um, discuss some of these and the conversation we're having next, um, but just, just some of them I jotted down included um, being, uh, you know, working to build capacity rather than extracting from communities, um, building collaboration and trust and shared goals and transparency about those goals, um, responsibility to learn, uh, to, sorry, responsibility to share the things that you, you know and that you learn um, honoring others' uh, knowledge and investment in their communities and amplifying their voices, um, ensuring informed consent uh, or informed risk-taking and security, um, and looking beyond English uh, Global North-centric resources and perspectives. Um, and hopefully we can keep on talking about these, um, but this was just to give you an introductory sense of, of what we do at Witness and, and how we do it. And that's it for me. All right. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. 
Um, all right, so thank you again um, for all being here. I'm very excited to be talking with everyone and on this panel with everyone. Uh, so I'll be talking about documenting the now, which was mentioned a little bit in Lauren's uh, talk earlier. So I'm the user experience designer for documenting the now. Uh, DocNow is a community and a set of tools developed around supporting the ethical collection, use, and preservation of social media content, and really of all born digital content we've been expanding recently. Um, Alex, next slide, please. Uh, okay, so uh, first, we are not just a development team. We are definitely a community-focused team, which is why we're on this call today. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what our community is. Um, next slide. So first, uh, we are a community of practitioners. This is our team. Documenting the Now was started with Ed Summers and Burgess Jewels in 2014. Uh, Francis and I joined the team in 2014 as well. Uh, recently, we've expanded the team with a few more uh, researchers, academics, developers, archivists. Uh, we're a very interdisciplinary team. Uh, next slide. Uh, the community is much larger than our team, so we have various ways of interacting with the larger archival activist, researcher, academic community. Uh, here are the ways that we try to reach out and communicate with people. Uh, our Slack channel in particular is a space where we have a lot of these conversations. Recently, we've been using our Medium uh, news channel to record interviews with activists, uh, mostly around Occupy Wall Street. We also invite the community to participate in our code base. Uh, we talk on Twitter, like most of us do, and we do have an email list as well. So we try to really um, not just work in a silo, but be talking regularly to various communities as we do our work. Next slide, please. Additionally, um, extending from our community uh, inter internal to DOC now, we do have an advisory board. This was the advisory board from our last grant period. We recently started our next grant and our advisory board is changing up a little, but these uh, academics and work, yeah, researchers and uh, colleagues in the field have also been informing our work and uh, we're very thankful to them. They've been uh, regularly coming to meetings, which I know can be very hard for an advisory board. Uh, next slide, please. And as I mentioned, we have meetings. So one of the things that we've been trying to do over the last five years is actually convene in digital or real space this larger community. So we do have rather irregular uh, Twitter chats and we try to reach out to um, the profession, like the archival profession, as well as the practitioners. We have advisory board meetings, and then recently we have been um, hosting symposia. So we had Digital Blackness in the Archive in Ferguson, where our work started uh, in 2017, and last year we co-hosted with Rhizome uh, Ethics and Archiving the Web Symposium. Uh, the links to some of these events are available in the resource sheet. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so in addition to a community, we are uh, developers, so we, we do create a set of tools. So some of them you've already heard about a little bit, but I wanted to walk through the progression of the tools that we've been building uh, over the last few years. Next slide, please. So the first tools that were built by Ed Summers at um, the beginning of our project were Twark and the Hydrator, which are tools that work with Twitter's API. So Twark is a command line tool that pulls down Twitter JSON, and the Hydrator is a tool that you can rehydrate tweet IDs. So Twitter's uh, terms of service indicate that to respect um, the right to be forgotten, you should only share tweet IDs, which both Lauren and Jessica mentioned earlier. The hydrator is a way to call back to Twitter and hydrate your tweet IDs back into full tweets, and it will only show you the tweets that still exist on Twitter. Um, next slide, please. From uh, Torque and Hydrator, we started building DocNow, which is an appraisal tool for Twitter. So this was uh, something that we've been developing over the last few years. It's still in demo mode at demo.docnow.io. Uh, but we really wanted to 
kind of address the fact that yes, Twark can pull down tons of data, but what does that mean for an archivist? A data set is not an archive. Um, and what are the ethical implications of just pulling data because you can? Uh, so we started with the archival principle of appraisal and decided to build a tool that was really focused around appraisal. So the DocNow tool allows you to look at what's going on, uh, trending, look through hashtags, user accounts, and start to craft a uh, collection that that is not just pull all um, and really break out what it is that you're looking at into tweets, users, media, URLs, the various patterns that you can see to determine what it is that you actually want to collect. Uh, this is both to um, hearken to archival values, but also there is a practical part of this, which is if you're hosting a tool on something like AWS rather than having it just running off of your desktop, uh, it gets very expensive very quickly to, to pull Twitter data if you're just trying to suck it up in a vacuum. Uh, our demo tool is costing us hundreds of dollars a month just to be playing around with small data sets. So in addition to the fact that we should all be doing our work in a very um, caring and concerted way, there are um, administrative needs to not just pull everything. Uh, next, please. So we also built something we call the catalog, which is a public uh, list of shared tweet IDs. So we created this pretty um, haphazardly just because we realized we needed a place to start gathering uh, all of the tweet IDs that we were putting out into various data repositories in the institutions that we worked at, and also to uh, allow others that are working in the field to put Twitter data sets together. Um, we only have five pieces of metadata up there right now. It was really um, a fast and dirty way of doing it. And during this grant period, we plan on really expanding and rethinking what the catalog is and what it can be. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. And one of the things that we think it can be is a place where uh, the social humans labels can exist. So the next project that uh, I worked on over the summer at the Harvard Library Innovation Lab was a set of labels for the ethical reuse of social media content, um, which are broken out into two sets of labels. Uh, social humans labels, which empower content creators to indicate if and how they want their data to be used, and SHA labels to allow archivists and academics to share contextual information about the data. So we plan to uh, wrap up the SHA labels into the catalogs so that when archivists are sharing their data sets, they can give us a little more information about them. Uh, next slide, please. So while we've been building all of these tools and working with the community, um, and the various institutions that are working on starting to collect more digital material. Uh, we were exploring the ethical implications of all of this work, and that resulted in a white paper written by Ed Summers and Burgess Jules, uh, released in 2018, with a set of recommendations. The white paper is in the resources list. Uh, it's not too long, so I suggest you read it. Um, but basically, we have four recommendations which are echoing what everyone else in this call has said already, but that archivists should engage and work with the communities they wish to document. The documentation efforts must go beyond what can be collected without permission from the web and social media. Uh, we did hear from activists in Ferguson that what they put on social media is less than 1% of the work they're doing. It's really just the tip of an iceberg. Uh, archivists should follow social media's platforms terms of service where they are congruent with the values of the communities they are attempting to document. Uh, there are restrictions put on by some of these platforms that uh, we don't think always jive with what the archival community needs to do. And when possible, archivists should apply traditional archival practices such as appraisal, collection development, and donor relations to social media and web materials, which we've heard from the others on this call that they're already doing, which is great and exciting. Uh, last slide, please. So I wanted to just end with saying what we're doing next is, which is we're continuing to develop and iterate on all of these tools. Uh, none of these tools have provided a perfect answer to the problem. As uh, Jessica mentioned, none of this can really be automated, but we're here to work with the communities to help understand how we can do the best we can to provide services to everyone. Um, and part of that is we are starting to work with activist communities directly to build their own archives. So we have started a project called Documenting Activism Now, which is working with the Makudu team to go to various activist communities and 
kind of work with them and train them up to build their own digital archives. So we are going to be working with Don't Shoot Portland, Black Youth Project, Texas After Violence, um, a variety of other groups. We actually have an open call on our website. Uh, we have five selected and we have another five that are open um, to really go from a reactive model where we're kind of responding to things that are happening in our society to a proactive model where we're supporting activist groups from the beginning so that if and when uh, a large action happens that needs to be documented, they already have all the tools available to them. Um, yeah, so we we hope that you know we don't have answers, but we're we're exploring like everyone else, and we hope to be of service to this community. Thanks. Um, thank you all so much um, for those very informative and um, well timed <laughs> uh, presentations of your work. Um, so. For this portion, um, I know that we've talked a little bit about having a facilitated discussion uh, among you know, the four of you, and then also um, being open to, to questions from our audience um, via the chat window. So, um, and, and really encouraging kind of an organic discussion among, among the four of you as you know, perhaps having questions um, for each other, uh, and so, yeah, I'll I'll stop for one minute and say, you know, if if the four, if any of you have a particular question that you wanted to start with, um, otherwise, I can. <laughs> I have a series of questions I'd love to love to ask, and I'm sure uh, folks in the participants would also. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute all of you. To make sure. Yeah. Lauren, there we go. Um, everybody, there we go. Oops. Okay. So is everybody able to see each other and talk? Yes. yes. So I was just looking at, Amy had asked a really good question in the chat. I was looking at, or a couple of questions. Ah, yes. So, um, Sam, are you able to, to talk? Uh, I am. Okay. Um, can, Are you able to talk? <laughs> if you all want to take on those questions, I could read them out loud so everybody hears them at least once. Um, that would be great. So, uh, in developing initiatives for born digital collecting, how have you approached issues of labor and capacity? For one, how have you, as individuals, departments, organizations, etc., determined what not to do in order to operate? these uh, really very time and labor intensive endeavors and thinking about capacity in another sense, what sustains you and your colleagues in doing this work? So labor and capacity. Thoughts? I guess uh, I can start maybe with a thought um, in terms of um, deciding like what not to do to be able to do things like this. Um, I think, you know, I work at a pretty large special collections library, so that may help in some ways. Um, but I think when there really is a lot going on, when there's been a demonstration or something quite significant has happened, um, kind of other work gets deprioritized and this work gets the priority, you know, for that kind of, um, you know, three or four weeks where we might really need to be paying very close attention to all the different things that are happening um, and doing appraisal and trying to make some decisions and um, just stay current in what's going on. Um, so that's kind of one, one way.
Do others want to jump in on this question? Oh, I think Alex was talking, but it was um, muted. She may need Alex, did you want to go ahead? Uh, I can throw out an answer too, maybe. Um, okay, sorry. Um, oh, go ahead. Um, sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Uh, I was just saying that from a non-institutional perspective, um, one of the things that my colleague Burgess has done is been working on a program called Architecting Sustainable Futures, where we talk about how funding is applied to these types of projects and how it's kind of a starvation level of funding where projects are, are bound to die and really working with grant uh, giving institutions to change that model. And in terms of labor, uh, we're very lucky that the funding that we get from Mellon, uh, we are able to actually pay the activists that we are working with to to be creating born digital content for themselves. Um, and we believe that paying for labor is incredibly important. Uh, so that is one way that, that we are um, thinking about labor is just making sure that everyone is paid. Um, yeah, Yvonne, if you wanna. Yeah, I guess just to sort of reinforce what um, you were saying, Alex, like it's, I think it's important to always keep in mind like uh, power dynamics and economic inequalities in the in our different relationships and like it's interesting like witness we're a fairly small organization relative to like institutions and and places like that but you know with in relation to our partners often with we're the very well resourced organization compared to a lot of people that we work with um, so I think it's always being conscious of that and you know for us um, you know sometimes like I mean we sometimes our projects move very slowly because we kind of we want to support the work that our partners are doing when they're ready to do it and if something else is a priority for them at that time then that's that's how it is um, we're trying to make a more of an effort now to sort of see how we can support um, our partners not just with training and resources but also um, you know making sure that they have the 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 you know financial or, or like sort of uh, tangible resources they need um, to to achieve their their um, advocacy goals as well. Yeah, this is one thing I'll I'll just add a little bit. This is Lauren just speaking again from a from an institutional perspective, um, similar to to Jessica. It's kind of uh, there's certainly a lot of time and labor intense work that goes into, I'm going to zoom into a granular level, what we've tried to do a little bit to help with some of those very labor intensive endeavors, so something like web archiving, for example, is to both, you know, ensure that we are paying uh, a good wage to anybody who's doing work, so whether they're graduate students, we, we have a policy that we pay, there's no free, you know, labor or internships, and I'm glad for that that departmental policy so that there is labor being done on these materials um, it is being supported and paid for and the other thing is you know just going back to the comments about appraisal um, and selection and kind of the application of archival principles to these materials very much can help mitigate some of this labor that's done so for example a small thing we've done um, getting back to the point about like how much you're able to collect with these tools sometimes. We had something in the web archives form for submission, it turned out it worked super well, but what that meant was we had a huge number of web archives uh, and links submitted. So we applied some selection principles to those. Some of it inevitably was benign neglect, you know, the 4chan threads that delete after, you know, you reach a certain number, we can't, you know, collect, but, Things like going through and doing actual selection and appraisal for submissions is also a way that we, you know, kind of structurally try to stem some of that. But yes, definitely paying people, making sure people are well compensated and treated in a in a manner that uh, suits to a later question about the types of material they're also expected to work with is certainly a part of a, a strong part of that too. So we've got another question from Wendy in the chat, uh, but Wendy, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Um, so if you want to say your question out loud, go for it. Or 
or not. So Wendy's question was, how would you approach uh, documenting the the foil of a movement event? Do you feel a professional obligation to, to cap capture different viewpoints on a topic? What do you see as an ethical way of approaching documenting counter movements, for example? Yeah. So I'll, I'll start on this one again. This is an institutional perspective, and I really want to hear from from folks who are not uh, part of an institution about what this framework looks like. It's probably completely different. But so for for UVA, um, we rely on curators to select the materials, and part of their professional knowledge is representation and selection around collections. And so. And that way, uh, I can say, for example, at UVA, we do have um, representation of viewpoints. Uh, that is on the web archive side, where there has been some selection of media uh, organizations that represent various viewpoints. Um, again, this being Charlottesville, we also had local people here who are very much part of these movements and who graduated from UVA. So we also had some selection of materials around that. But it is a very um, delicate balance. And this also speaks to the fact that we haven't made everything public yet. And there's still a lot of discussions around what you amplify, I think, by collecting certain things. And there are people who study these topics and know much more about it than I do. I know um, Joan Donovan is one of the folks who work in this area. But this is just to say, at this institution, we do have some representation of those, um, some representation, I think, of, of the various viewpoints on that aspect. Yeah. can also kind of follow up with, a, I guess, another institutional um, kind of perspective on this as well. Um, we have not really done a ton of really active outreach or calls for submissions from people yet. Um, that's not been something that we've kind of made at the forefront of our approach so far. Um, but, you know, in kind of our the way that we're kind of prioritizing the work, we are trying to center you know, we have had conversations like as a team in University Archives that we want to center the anti-racist um, activists and like the student kind of leaders in what we're proactively looking for, appraising, um, you know, thinking about wa wanting in the collection that we have so going so far. Um, but there are also, you know, the hashtag silent Sam um, has been used by a variety of people. So that is one place where there would be more than one perspective being represented. I think we've also done like news articles after different demonstrations and things that kind of like a digital clipping file in the web archives. So that's another place where um, kind of the, I guess the other side um, of things would be, would be captured. Um, there have also been some like Facebook events and things that um, have been shared and that we've seen um, for all the various kind of uh, protests that have happened on campus. So I guess kind of our thought process so far has really been um, to do the best we can to center the student leaders and the anti-racist um, kind of activists. Uh, but, you know, it still is an important um, consideration of kind of the, the counter movements and, and how that should be handled. Um, kind of in the moment, I guess. So. Uh, I think we, we have a question from Erin. Uh, let's see. Yeah, look, uh, so one of our, in the chat, one of our one of our participants asked um, if anyone has thought about how they may address the collection, accidental or intentional, of tweets that are created and amplified by bots or troll farms. And Alex, uh, you seem excited to talk about this. <laughs> yeah, um, so it's, it's definitely been something that we've been thinking about a lot as, as we uh, 
have done, uh, we've built a tool that senders appraisal. You can actually see some of that when you're when you're looking in the doc now tool as you're starting to appraise. Uh, one of the features that we built in is so small, but actually matters a lot, which is how many tweets per hour an account makes. Uh, if it's an account that is tweeting more than like 60 tweets per hour, it's like somewhat likely that it's not a real person. Um, and there's a bunch of other indicators of that. Uh, so one of the social humans labels, the NSH label is called Probabot. And uh, there's a, a series of indicators in the metadata that will indicate that something is a bot, such as how new the account is compared to how many followers it got, how quickly it gets certain followers. If the keyboard language is different than the language that the text has been written in, the number of tweets per hour, if it's tweeting saying that it's coming from an IP address in the US, but it's tweeting only in the middle of the night, it might be bouncing IPs. There's a bunch of small indicators that give a you know low percentage of possibility that it is a bot, but when you add them all together, you can find a much more higher prob probability. There's also image hashing that you can do. Um, Many bots use a lot of American flags in their header images on Twitter. Uh, so there's some indicators that when you're going through the appraisal process and looking at it visually in Doc Now, you actually can find them a little bit. And then this is actually a space where Twitter does a pretty good job of finding and closing bots sometimes. Uh, we all know that they also have a pretty good track record of not shutting down bots, but the, the act of rehydration will often take out many bots uh, from a tweet collection. So hydration, in addition to uh, preserving the right to be forgotten, does actually pull out bot accounts. So uh, it's something that we're very excited to be like looking into and trying to find. So that's from a methodological uh, tech perspective. I'm sure that someone else has it from an institutional perspective. Well, for, I have not thought as much about, I guess, kind of bots. Our um, collection of tweet IDs so far, I feel like it's kind of a small data kind of thing. It's not like, you know, millions of tweets or anything um, like that. So I don't know if that kind of has an effect on whether or not bots or things might be showing up. Um, I feel like somewhat related to this, and I would be interested to hear what other panelists kind of think about this. Um, but we have you know, thought about asking permission for like Twitter accounts and things, but they're not always like an account for a person. They're like an account um, just sort of related to the movement. Um, and it, you may, it may not always be clear like who they are. Um, and so in kind of trying to have that um, conversation about permissions and contact with, with folks, um, you know, how much verification do you need of like who is behind that account um, before you collect it? And like in the context of, um, you know, kind of a, a student movement where students are, you know, putting themselves at risk to protest their institution, kind of wanting to understand that they might want to be anonymous, but, um, you know, also you don't want to collect an account that's like not actually really representative of what's happening. Um, so I feel like that's somewhat related to like getting bots in in with the collection as well. So this is, I don't really have an answer, but I would be interested to know if other panelists have thought about this as well. I, th I think one uh, a sort of broader uh, theme that this question of bots raises is just in terms of like the vast amount of misinformation, disinformation and hate speech that is being spread around on social media that has like, re like real world, world effects on people, like people being subject to mob violence and killings um, that we've seen in like Sri Lanka and in India and in Burma and elsewhere. Um, and I'm just maybe another kind of question to throw out there is like, what is our responsibility as archivists or as information professionals to addressing that misinformation, um, you know, in terms of building literacy, in terms of speaking out against um, how it's being used. Um, I don't have, I don't, I, I don't know exactly, but I just thought I would throw it out, throw it out there. Yeah, I'm curious yeah. if other, yep, go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah, I was just gonna say, I shared, I think folks saw in the chat, but this, as um, 
as the event specifically, yeah, I absolutely agree with this, uh, the idea around misinformation, the fact of, you know, the kind of what the Unite the Right hashtag. Um, unfortunately, this was such a, a large event that a lot of it was picked up, you know, there were bots pushing things and the folks at DocNow have done, Aaron Gallagher, I think is a researcher, um, uh, who had done a study along with Ed. So that's the link that I put in <clears throat> that folks can read about, you know, exactly what um, kind of happens around these things. And this honestly was another reason why knowing the kind of scale of the, the hashtags and how this was picked up that, that made us, um, you know, who were new to kind of working with, thinking about handling this kind of flexing event, the scale and the continued um, actions around what is also being pushed on Twitter was a, a reason to also kind of hang back and think very carefully about what kind of releasing this data would look like. So whether that was amplifying, you know, activity that was happening on Twitter and potentially putting information out there um, via our own collection, you know, local kind of activists who may have been, you know, more easily identified, you know, there was a lot of doxing that had happened immediately after this event. So these were certainly all things that, you know, I, I hope, you know, a scale of something like this doesn't, you know, happen again here locally, but it was certainly something that prompted us to make decisions around this. And it's, and it's hard, you know, speaking to the scale of the, the data, um, it's hard to do this kind of work carefully if you don't have this kind of background and knowledge of these materials, as well as, you know, kind of knowledge of what's happening in the community and what's needs to be pushed on certain groups um, via these kind of trolls or bots. Um, yeah, so this is just saying, having experience with a large collection like this and the kind of repercussions locally of continued harassment, um, it's, a, it's something to think very carefully about. Can I just add on to that? Um, Absolutely. Lauren's yeah. point. Um, another example I thought of just in, what, in terms of what you were saying, in terms of working with communities so that you can, um, because of the need to have sort of local knowledge of events and circumstances, um, another example is, um, you know, in Burma with Facebook in the last mm -hmm. year, you know, like uh, a lot of, there were a lot of problems with content mo moderation of like hate speech that was being posted on Facebook and Facebook's inability to sort of take it down. And then, but then on the flip side, taking down stuff that was uh, documentation of abuse that activists were posting. Um, and a lot of that had to do with lack of familiarity, like lack of um, content moderators who were uh, local to the situation, could understand the language, understand the context of what was being shared. Um, so it is, I think, really important to, to, to in order to really understand the collections that that we have, um, you know, to to work with people with that local knowledge. So I have kind of a question off of this um, that I was thinking about that I kind of wrote down earlier on that we I think maybe was in one of the um, potential discussion questions that we had. But anyway, um, you know, in thinking about reaching out to the communities and talking to them, I wonder just a lot about the right timing and um, like, you know, wanting to do that, but also wanting to respect the, um, you know, the priorities of people and that, you know, documentation and archiving and stuff may be like totally not a priority and just not the right time to approach people about this, especially when, um, you know, things are still so ongoing. Um, so I don't know if, and this is just something that I like wonder if the three of you have suggestions because <laughs> we think about this a lot and we haven't done a ton of like active, like, hey, you know, let's work together and let's do this, you know, let's archive things because um, it just doesn't feel like uh, the right time um, with so many things um, being uncertain um, and a lot of, um, protests and things still actively happening. Um, so I, I guess because there's always like this, you know, thing of like, if you approach someone about the archives, are you implying that like their movement's over? Um, and 
we certainly don't ever want to do that, um, but we do want to be transparent and communicating with, with people. So I will stop talking now, <laughs> but I'll be interested to hear what the three of you might, might think about that or have experience with that. Yeah, it was definitely uh, a struggle for us. Um, so we started right after um, Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson and uh, watching kind of the way the narrative was playing out on mainstream media and watching what was going on on Twitter. There were some people in Ferguson that clearly were doing a lot of activism and we were seeing what was going on on Twitter. And the question of when and how to contact them was was huge. Um, and we, we tried to do a very light touch uh, took like a year and a half before we really got in touch with them. But I think what we learned um, as now we're doing much more act, like proactive working with communities is uh, to like what we decided was like, if you can provide space, provide food, compensation and honest listening with no end goal. Like you should not be, at least in my experience, like you shouldn't be going there being like, our end goals, we want to get your stuff in the archive, um, because that is extractive, as Yvonne said in her talk. Um, but just to to let them know you're there, know you're interested, know what your skill set is, and like how archives can not just provide records of movement, but actually really sustain movements, that it isn't, you know, when it goes into the archive, it becomes dead, but it just can be regenerative and be a, like a way of like, you know, real culture that the archive can provide as well, but really have no goal of of getting anything at the end of the day. That's that's been our experience. And I no, go ahead, Lauren. Oh, I, yeah, go ahead, or Yvonne, or I wasn't sure if Lauren was trying to talk because I could see her name on the screen, but I, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll just, I'll go. Um, yeah, I totally agree with you, um, Alexandra. I, you know, I think it's important that archives are embedded in the communities where they work. And so ideally, like the relationship starts long before, um, you know, you're doing the collecting um, and that the archive is on board with what that you know that group uh, or community is trying to do and um and the and the change that they're seeking um uh, one another thought i had um was just to you know again to being aware of um potential like power differentials and you know um co like uh, the the potential situation where the the content is might be being created to sort of meet the, the institution's expectations rather than being created um, by, by the content creators for their own purposes and, and hope, like making sure to sort of avoid that um, situation where you're putting content creators in situations that could be like traumatizing for them or dangerous for them for the sake of creating this documentation um, or also potentially re-traumatizing people who they might be interviewing or collecting testimonies um, from, um, and this is again, going back to, to Burma again, this is a situation that we've seen happening in Burma with um, journalists who um, are re-interviewing uh, survivors of uh, gender-based violence over and over again, sort of, um, and, and collecting, you know, like having them rehash their stories over and over again, which not only um, has the effect of re-traumatizing that person, but actually in terms of um, the like any potential criminal trials, having those multiple prior um, testimonies can actually uh, hurt the, or complicate the, the case. Those are all extremely good points, I think. And the only thing I'll add, again, kind of from this very this institutional perspective, which as additional framework, the, the reason I, I mentioned the fact that we didn't have a university archivist in 2018 is that that's one of the, you know, as you know, uh, Jessica, hopefully one of the ways that you build, you know, I would say like time and trust of, you know, student groups when we did meet with them, um, they didn't have a relationship, you know, to your, your point about timing um, and what other folks have talked about, if you're only coming to folks like after something has has happened and you don't have a standing relationship, you know, I can certainly understand why 
people would wonder why you were doing that and what the motives were, even though, you know, they know that you're part of the institution and part of the university archive, there can be questions about that. And I'm, I'm really glad that they gave us some time that they did. You know, the student groups asked us great questions, you know, to the point around how would these things be described if we gave them the archives? Um, would we be allowed to do something like create an exhibition um, for us? And these are all really good questions, I think, for folks to think about as we, you know, again, in the institutional context, think about how we work with communities and kind of on the Charlottesville and community-based side where we also had some um, interaction. Some of that drew from pre-existing relationships, um, folks who maybe were already involved in some of these groups and had trusted ties. Um, that brought people to us, and I and I think that's probably shared with with other folks on the call. Where if there is an establishment of that already, that's a way to kind of frame some steps moving forward. And again, yes, not expecting anything extracted out of a meeting necessarily. Coming away with like, well, what do you? We're, we're going to come away with some things you're going to donate by the end of this. We kind of approached it as we're collecting on this side. What are you all collecting? With how can we help you either supplement or kind of share what we're collecting, so maybe there's not a, a duplicative effort. So for community groups, we kind of took that approach where there are several groups who are already building, you know, archives of their own, and we kind of met to talk and touch base and, and think about, like, what funding looks like, um, what our kind of structural collection looks like versus, like, what they were thinking about collecting, and so kind of, kind of working on these relationships. And that's, it takes time, it takes trust, um, and it's, it's something that, you know, it, it's a hard thing because after an event, you know, like this happens, especially at an institution, the immediate, and Thomas Padilla used this phrase, this sense of academic opportunism, I think is what he, what he had said. You know, he was, he was the, um, at UNLV when the shooting happened there and had also had um, experience in this. And it's kind of, that's the kind of feeling, and I feel like that's such a good way to put it, is how do we come at this from a place of, um, kind of genuine, you know, trust building and things, even if you're attached to an institution, what does that look like? And I think these are all ways to, to think about that. Yeah, yeah these are, um, these are great, great points. Um, and I guess one thing I was I was wondering before we kind of wrap up because we're we're unfortunately almost out of time. <laughs> How did that happen? Um, is uh, the issue of consent, which we it's it sort of is broadly in the background of what we've been talking about, but um, are there ways that any of you have found um, to kind of build that into the process of either reaching out to folks or you know how do you think about this issue of consent and is there any sort of advising that happens around the collection of tweets and, and that sort of thing? I can talk a little bit quickly about that. Um, so one thing that I think Jessica mentioned was, or I'm sorry, it was Jessica or Lauren mentioned, uh, collecting hashtags instead of key phrases. Um, I think that's important. I think indicator uh, hashtags are an indication of joining in a public conversation. Uh, one of the SHA labels is actually uh, called semi-private space, which is that we know that Twitter is not used as a public platform for all people. Some people are just talking to their friends. So if you're not using hashtags and you have small Twitter followers and you seem to be talking to a small group, um, which is, are all things that you can kind of see in the appraisal process. Uh, like one thing that I would suggest labeling at is semi-private space and maybe that tweet doesn't end up being in the collection that you end up publishing uh, because those people weren't having the same conversation as everyone else. Uh, the end goal for Doc Now is collect slow, slow archiving, small archiving, and actual consent from collect uh, from who you're collecting. But uh, we recognize that that's not possible from a labor perspective for all people. So there are some kind of technological indicators that uh, we look to. But I'd like to hear from other people about that. Um, one, one question I had actually maybe for um, the other panelists who are doing like social media collecting and tweet collecting is how do you deal with consent um, in relation to people who are documented in the in the tweet or in the media as opposed to the, the creators? 
Um, how do you address that? I don't know. <laughs> um, I guess would be, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, so sorry, at one point I was answering a, a question in the chat, so I'm sorry if I like missed a piece of the conversation. Um, uh, but I think that that is a really hard question, kind of if, um, you know, someone is being retweeted, like I was mentioning earlier, you know, we are looking for just the hashtags in the way that we're collecting tweets, we don't search for keywords, um, but that doesn't account for someone who might be retweeted um, by someone else who is using a hashtag. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think maybe you know setting parameters on how much you're collecting is is one way to like limit um, the impacts. But I don't know how you would go about like getting consent. Yeah, I see this a lot in the media, particularly because we're um, we're often tracking protest movements that there are all these photographs where you can easily identify people. And I mean, luckily, Doc, now we're not a repository, so we just kind of think about these things, but we don't have an answer. We're not republishing them. So, uh, but it is something that we see coming through as we're, we're studying the social media content. And um, I don't have an answer. <laughs> And I suppose it's a problem that even, you know, uh, more traditional collections and archives have to deal with. I, I, one of the things I put in the resource list was an article I just saw in the Times a couple of days ago, a descendant of um, uh, slaves who were documented in the Harvard collection has sued the university um, to, to get control of those. I think there are some daguerreotypes um, of her descendants who had been kind of forcibly documented. Okay, well, just to keep us all uh, on a tidy timeline, I am so thankful for having the four of you here today and all of the participants who joined us um, and asked some really amazing and thought-provoking questions. And um, we look forward to these kinds of, you know, this is only the first in our inaugural roundtable discussion. Uh, so we are really grateful for your time and, um, if you want to, I put a little link to signing up for the uh, Big Curator Consortium mailing list where you can follow um, when we announce uh, the release of this recording and future um, roundtables we'll be holding as well as um, uh, some of the, we're going to annotate the slides and uh, uh, yeah, and then also just be sure to check out the resources list and Let's continue this conversation. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much.